Hello, and welcome to The Turbulent World, with me, James M. Dorsey, as your host. The coming week or two could determine Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's political fate and reshape the Biden administration's support for Israel's Gaza war. That is, if Mr. Netanyahu fails to comply with War Cabinet member Benny Gantz's demand that the Prime Minister produce a plan for the post-war administration of Gaza by June 8, and Mr. Gantz makes good on his threat to resign. Mr. Netanyahu has refused to spill out a post-war plan, as long as Israel has not destroyed Hamas, in part because he fears his ultra-nationalist and ultra-conservative coalition partners will collapse the government if he proposes anything short of total Israeli control of the Strip. The Biden administration, Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant, and senior military commanders share Mr. Guntz's frustration. If Mr. Guntz resigns, he will likely be joined by fellow War Cabinet member and former Israel Defense Forces Chief of Staff Gabi Eisenkot. Mr. Guntz has good reason to stand by his ultimatum. A recent Israeli opinion poll suggests that while he would still win an election, continued presence in the government is beginning to cost him. The poll showed Mr. Guntz at 38%, down from his 46% in January, while Mr. Netanyahu's numbers increased to 30%, up from 24% six months ago. While Mr. Netanyahu would still lose an election, the poll suggests Mr. Guntz can ill afford to risk his popularity further. One of four scenarios is likely depending on how Mr. Guntz decides and was probably part of U.S. President Joe Biden's decision to officially announce his Qatar and Egypt-backed ceasefire in a bid to pressure both Hamas and Israel. Mr. Netanyahu could stall until his address to the U.S. Congress sometime after June 15. Mr. Netanyahu could dump his most militant ultra-nationalist and ultra-conservative coalition partners, represented by National Security Minister Itamar Ben-Gvir and Finance Minister Bezalel Smotrich, who oppose a ceasefire deal that would lead to the release of Hamas-held hostages. Instead, Mr. Netanyahu could form a government cooperating with Mr. Guntz, opposition leader Yair Lapid, Shas, and United Torah Judaism, who favor a ceasefire and hostage deal. Mr. Netanyahu decides to roll the dice and call for snap elections if Messrs. Guntz and Eisenkot resign. And finally, Messrs. Guntz and Eisenkot resign, leaving Mr. Netanyahu even more beholden to Messrs. Benvir and Smotrich. The two far-right ministers sought to limit Mr. Netanyahu's space in ceasefire negotiations, with tens of thousands of their supporters marching on Jerusalem Flag Day through the Muslim quarter of Jerusalem to celebrate the conquest of the city by Israel in the 1967 Middle East War. Participating in the march, Mr. Benvir said, it sent Hamas a message that Jerusalem is ours. Referring to one of the entries to the old city of which the Muslim quarter is part and the Temple Mount that hosts the Al-Aqsa Mosque, Islam's third holiest site, Mr. Benvir asserted that the Damascus Gate is ours, the Temple Mount is ours, and God willing, Complete victory is ours. Militant supporters of Benvir attacked Palestinian residents and journalists, chanting death to the Arabs, may your village burn, and Shuafat is up in flames, a reference to an East Jerusalem Palestinian neighborhood. A Guns Eisenkot walkout 
that would make Mr. Netanyahu even more dependent on Messrs. Ben-Gvir and Smotrich would increase pressure on Mr. Gallant, the defense minister, to follow suit and complicate Mr. Biden's support for Israel. I know that there are those in Israel who would not agree with this plan and will call for the war to continue indefinitely. Some are even in the government coalition, and they've made it clear they want to occupy Gaza. They want to keep fighting for years, and the hostages are not a priority to them. I've urged the leadership in Israel to stand behind this deal, despite whatever pressure comes. Mr. Biden said, as he put forward his proposed ceasefire deal that appears to be based on a draft endorsed by Mr. Netanyahu. In effect, Mr. Biden was cautioning Mr. Netanyahu not to allow for a situation in which he increases rather than reduces his dependency on Messrs. ben and Smotrich. At the same time, Israeli analysts suggest that in Mr. Netanyahu's mind, potential international criminal court warrants for the arrest on war crime charges of the Prime Minister and Mr. Gallant is turning the continuation of the Gaza war into a liability rather than an asset that would ensure he remains in office. The United States and 16 other countries whose citizens were taken hostage by Hamas on October 7 increased pressure on Mr. Netanyahu with the release of a joint statement calling on Israel and Hamas to conclude a ceasefire deal. Meanwhile, the United Nations Security Council, with Mr. Netanyahu potentially at a crossroads, appears to have delayed discussing a resolution that would endorse Mr. Biden's ceasefire plan. The United States initially circulated a draft resolution in support of the plan that was likely to be vetoed by Russia and China because it put the onus of acceptance on Hamas. That would be more difficult to do with an Israeli government void of most adults in the room. With the United States less vulnerable because of its stubborn support of Israel than many assume, Mr. Netanyahu may believe that he can use his congressional speech to get away with whatever fallout a departure of Messrs. Guntz and Eisenkut would have. Mr. Netanyahu may be right that the United States feels less pressured to tighten the screws on Israel with deeds rather than words. To be sure, the U.S. has lost moral standing because of perceived double standards in its approach towards the Ukraine and Gaza wars. U.S. diplomats preaching human rights and the rule of law would likely be laughed out the door. Nevertheless, Gulf states and various Asian nations view the United States still as the only security game in town. Moreover, support for Israel has barely cost the United States economically, except for food franchises like Starbucks, which suffer from boycotts in several Middle Eastern countries. In late May, a previously unknown group, Ashab al Khaf, People of the Cave, attacked several U.S. food outlets in Baghdad, including KFC and Chili House. Even so, countries like Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates prefer cooperating with the U.S. over China on technology, including artificial intelligence. Mr. Netanyahu's problem is that Mr. Biden's frustration with the Israeli Prime Minister and his ultra-nationalist and ultra-conservative partners has little to do with the cost of U.S. support for Israel, and potentially more with an emerging historic shift in what was once a special relationship between the United States and Israel said prominent Middle East analyst Hussein Ibish, the rift between the Israeli government and Mr. Biden, and indeed between Israel and the U.S. over Gaza, appears to be widening at every phase. This is not 
an ordinary rift. It has all the makings of the beginning of the end of the special relationship that has existed between the two countries since the late 1960s. And, as things stand, it's only likely to get worse over time. Thank you for joining me. I hope you enjoyed today's column and podcast. The turbulent world depends on the support of its readers to cover the cost of producing the column and podcast. You can contribute by clicking on Substack on the subscription button at jamesmdorsey.substack.com and choosing one of the subscription options. Thank you. Take care and best wishes. Thank you.